An aspect of reading Othello that can't be overlooked is the issue of race in the play. Now what I would like to do is give you a bit of an overview of that and the various implications for reading the play. And to begin with, we should start by looking at uh, attitudes to race in Renaissance England. And a really useful place to begin this is by looking at Leo Africanus's work, The History and Description of Africa from 1600. This holds a Arab Africans in high esteem, but not so for sub-Saharan Africans. So by beginning with the city-dwelling coastal Moroccans or Libyans, um, Africanus describes them as most honest people, destitute of all fraud and guile. And he goes on at the end of this to say that they keep their covenant most faithfully, insomuch they had rather die than break promise. So this is a very honorable, noble image. And this is in contrast to the inhabitants of Libya, Libya who live a brutish kind of life, who neglecting all kinds of good arts and scientists, sciences do wholly apply their minds unto theft and violence. And if we look again at the end of this in the second last sentence, the Negroes likewise lead a beastly kind of life, being utterly destitute of the use of reason and dexterity of wit and of all arts. And the contrast between these two has um, significant implications for how we read Othello. And we'll read on and find out that um, there were differing views as to whether Othello is the city-dwelling noble Arab African or the sub-Saharan black African. And if we look at representations of, uh, of the other and different races in uh, the theatre in the period, we find that there is um, a whole, uh, many negative connotations through the language that arise. And here we have the Prince of Morocco from the Merchant of Venice saying, Mislike me not for my complexion. This kind of foreshadows uh, some of the language of Othello. But this is quite soft language when we consider how uh, Jacobean and Elizabethan theatre represented other races as being violent and um, bloodthirsty and lecherous. In this we have, in the night time secretly would I steal to travellers' chambers and there cut their throats. Ithamor is a Turkish character in Marlowe's The Jew of Malta. And here in George Peel's The Battle of Alcazar, we have um, that scorns the power and force of Portugal. Damned let him be, damned and condemned to bear all torments, tortures, plagues and pains of hell. And furthermore, in Thomas Decker's Lust Dominion, Reading towards the end here, we have that I might pile up Charon's boats so full until it topple o'er, and twould be sport to see them sprawl through the black slimy lake. So we have throughout Jacobean Elizabeth, Elizabethan theatre this villainous image of black men and black uh, and blackness in general. And yet in this period, the racial other was um, not necessarily commonplace, but there were definitely Africans living in London. And they appear in England in the late 16th century. And it was not entirely uncommon for people of wealth to have black musicians, footmen or servants. Even Queen Elizabeth had black musicians in her service. But in 1596, she tried to have them all expelled. And here is uh, an extract from the letter she wrote to have that done. And she, she begins it with, Her Majesty understandeth that there are of late diverse black moors brought into this realm, of which kind of people that are already here too many, considering how God hath blessed this land with great increase of people of our own nation, as any country of the world, whereof many of want of service and means to set them on work fall to idleness and great extremity. And so she's commanded that 10 of them be transported out of the realm, and we see that at the end. It's interesting that the number is as low as 10, which suggests at this point there aren't that many in England. Um, but what we, what the historians have found is that hardly any were actually expelled, because the people who, um, who had black servants in their households refused to give them up because there was no compensation on offer. And so... Um, Intiaz Habib, a historian and scholar, believes that Shakespeare would definitely have encountered black people in his neighbourhood. And he suggests that he may have even had a sexual relationship with a black woman. Regardless, this period, it marks the beginning of the discourse of the colonised and the coloniser, providing fruitful material for post-colonial critics. It's interesting to keep in mind that following the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the English Navy commanded the seas. And so in this period, England was beginning to look towards the New World. It was, look, it was um, sailing around Africa. 
And so England began to dominate. And this is the beginning of the colonial period in its genesis. And at this time, we have some engagement with the Moors. But the English dis distinguished between the Tawny Moors of the Mediterranean coast and the Southern Black Moors. And we saw that with Leo Africanus. And in 1600, 16 members of the embassy from Barbary uh, scandalized London by their dress and customs. And this leads us to this question, was, was Othello black? The text of the play isn't clear. The language makes it difficult to tell if Shakespeare intended the character to be a tawny moor or a black moor. But it leads us to the question, does it matter? And so some of the evidence to suggest that Shakespeare intended Othello to be black is through some of the language where we have Brabantio finding it inc incredible that Desdemona would cleave to a sooty bosom and how Othello laments that happily for I am black. Amelia sees Othello as a blacker devil. Rodrigo refers to him as thick lips and to Iago he's an old black ram. But some critics argue, however, that these instances might be hyperbole for a man who is only slightly darker than the Venetians. They would argue that Othello is more likely to be Arab in appearance. And we have the Duke assuring Brabantio that his son-in-law is far more fair than black, although this could be read figuratively, and all the instances of black could simply mean darker complexion. And the presence of the Barbary contingent in London in 1600 might suggest that they're Shakespeare's models. But this view might shift the focus of the reading away from race. It could be argued that, on the other hand, that asserting Othello is a so-called tawny moor reinforces the racist attitude towards darker Africans. The idea here is that, is it more permissible for Desdemona to fall in love with a so-called tawny moor than a black African? And that just reinforces this racist ideology that permeates the society at the time. Now, throughout the play, there is um, a significant amount of language that points to blackness. Now, Western discourse is often characterized by its insistence on reducing the world into binaries, man, woman, black, white, good, evil. The troubling aspect of this is that black, white, good, evil binaries have been subsumed into racial, racial discourse. And by equating black with evil, sin and savagery, savagery, the Western imagination becomes trapped in a racist discourse. And that's been fueled by the colonial experience with Africa. So if we look in Act 1, we can see Iago uh, using this reference to that your daughter is covered with a Barbary horse. You'll have nephews nay to you and you'll have courses for cousins and genets for Germans. I am one, sir, that comes to tell you that your daughter and the moor are now making the beast with two backs. So already we have in this this equation of blackness with bestiality. And that comes up quite a bit in the play. And then we have in, in scene three, um, Brabantio saying that she, in spite of nature, of years, of country, credit everything to fall in love with what she feared to look on. It is a judgment maimed and most imperfect that will confess perfection could so err against all rules of nature. And we have him here again uh, talking about how the love between Desdemona seems to defy nature and that witchcraft must be responsible. And in Act 2 we have Rodrigo uh, joking here about uh, making fun of Othello behind his back. Her eye must be fed and what delight shall she have to look on the devil. Loveliness in favour, manners and beauties, all which more is defective in. So we see Rodrigo employing this discourse that sees the black man as being inferior, devilish even. And this idea of devilishness is reinforced in Act 2, Scene 3 by Iago. When devils will their blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows. And then in Act 3, in Scene 3, we see, uh, I guess, the climax of this racial discourse. And this uh, passage here is quite significant because we have Iago in this scene here, in this, in this passage here, saying to Othello that sooner or later Desdemona is going to look upon him and realize she's done the wrong thing. And then she will recoil to her better judgment and then look upon her own country forms and happily repent and look back to her own kind as it were. And now we have Othello say, uh, questioning her, um, her fidelity. My name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as my own face. So here we have Othello succumbing to this racist discourse. He is using this racist discourse. He's not railing against it. And we see him starting to question himself. 
And then in Act 5, we have uh, uh, this racial discourse again through symbolisms of white. So, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow, and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, else she betray more men. Put out the light, then put out the light. Uh, if I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I again thy former light restore. But this, going back to this alabaster and whiteness, this symbol, uh, their symbols of perfection and beauty. And then we have Amelia. Oh, the more angel she, and you the blacker devil. Now this is a troubling aspect of Western discourse that has struggled to let go of this idea of white equals clean, pure, virginal, uh, perfect, black equals dirty, evil, devilish. And that's a discourse that uh, shows up throughout Othello. And one of the questions we ask ourselves is, is Shakespeare succumbing and replicating this, um, this discourse or is he challenging it? And there are arguments each way. And this brings us to the idea of race and ideology. Because whilst the play constructs a Venice where racist discourse is prevalent, in some circles it's no, by, by no means naturalised. Iago, Rodrigo and Brabantio share, certainly share this common racist worldview, and it's one that Iago exploits. But Desdemona doesn't subscribe to the ideology of racism. And Ju the Duke is the most interesting character in this regard, because he participates in the discourse of race. Your son-in-law is far more fair than black. But he's willing to look past race and see the man behind it. But Shakespeare presents a world where race and its importance is contested. And so there are differing views in here. So this racist discourse is not, the, uh, is not hegemonic in this world of Venice. And it's interesting that Shakespeare steps back from that and gives us the Duke who accepts um, Othello into the world of Venice because of his merits. But in the, in the theatrical history of Othello, we've got this question, can a white man play Othello? Because in the first 200 years of the play, uh, Othello was always played by a white man. And it wasn't until uh, the late 17th century that a woman first played Desdemona. And so blackface Othello has been quite common. Now, certainly up until the 19th century, often Othello was played as a tawny moor, that is, that Arabic-appearing North African. But in the past, it was common for white performers to paint themselves dark for black roles. However, it was most often done in mockery, as in the black minstrel shows. In the context of Shakespearean performance, it's considered racist for many reasons, and it reinforces this white control over the discourse of race. But uh, Orson Welles, um, his uh, 1952 film is quite a famous representation of Othello and it's nowhere near as controversial as Laurence Olivier's in 1965. It's been argued that his performance was more convincing and less like a minstrel show. So Orson Welles seems to have got away with it. But Laurence Olivier, who's considered the definitive Shakespearean actor who has played both Othello and Iago, did in 1965 a film version that raised some challenging questions about white actors playing Othello. He affected an accent for the role and polarised critical opinion. And critics at the time considered the concept of his playing Othello poorly conceived, even though many applauded his performance. Mocking the performance, however, the New York Times uh, critic Bosley Crowther, the film critic, uh, said you almost wait for him to whip a banjo out from his flowing white garments or start banging a tambourine. This is him saying, uh, sharing a view that uh, Olivier's performance harks to this uh, black minstrel uh, tradition in vaudeville, which was really quite racist and demeaning to black uh, to black people. But in 1981, uh, Anthony Hopkins uh, also darkened his skin for his performance. And it was the last time a white actor played Othello as a black man. Although Patrick Stewart's played Othello as a white man in an inverted production where everyone else around him was black. And so then there is a, there's actually a longer history of uh, black Othellos than one might realise. And although it was first played by a black man in 1833, it wasn't until the 20th century that it became the dominant idea that Othello should be played by a black man. 
Now, Ira Aldridge was the first ma black man ever to play Othello. He was born in New York in 1807, but he moved to uh, England in his late teens. His Othello drew vicious criticism from some circles. One newspaper objected to uh, Desdemona being poured about on the stage by a black man. Another commented that owing to the shape of his lips, it is utterly impossible for him to pronounce English. Responses outside of London, though, were a lot more favourable for Ira Aldridge. Paul Robeson's performance, however, was the watershed performance. He was a widely known film actor before being the first black man to play Othello for the Royal Shakespeare Company. He's well received, but even some positive views had racist undertones. One critic wrote that his triumph is merely because the simple nature of Othello is that of his own race, the race which boasts the shadowed livery of the burnished sun. And so this critic is suggesting that uh, that Robeson being black captured some kind of primitive simplicity of the character. So while being positive about the performance was really quite racist in his undertones. You, one could argue that Lawrence Fishburne's performance in 1995 cemented in the imagination of audiences the notion that Othello is a black man rather than an Arab. And it would be, it'll be ingrained in our imagination for quite some time to go. And it had a, an interesting performance by Kenneth Branagh as Iago. And so what does all this mean? Well, it means that race is a central concern for the play. There's no getting around that. The play both reflects the radi racial ideologies of the period and it challenges them. Because we can't forget that for all the racism, that Othello is a noble, strong character. And this is reinforced by critics such as A.C. Bradley um, right through into the late 20th century. And the play both reflect, um, and how we conceive of race in the play has implications for the meaning we make of it and how it's performed. So if we assume that Othello is an Arab-appearing man, that has implications for how we perform it and what meaning we're making of race in the play. And while Shakespeare wrote the play with the idea that a white man would play the title role, changes in audience and values have made this inappropriate. And so the play is often reinvented through performance and through this new meanings can be derived. And so it'll be quite interesting in the next realm of history of this play and other Shakespeare plays, how new performances and new imaginings of the play will shift what kind of meanings we make of it.